So I'm going to talk about uh, the challenges of improving safety in clinical systems beyond the safer clinical systems work, although I'm going to draw on our evaluation of that uh, significantly as I, as I talk. Uh, so the first challenge we need to confront is the inarticulacy of organisational routines and systems, and Andy's already uh, referred to this. So if I invited him to go across this uh, bridge, he might, on his bike, uh, he might have reasons to suspect my motives, because this bridge talks and it tells us this is not a very safe thing to do. But most of the systems we have in healthcare don't talk quite so clearly, and if we walk into this pharmacy, it's much more difficult for it to tell us that it's very likely to lead to um, an inadvertent uh, drug administration error. So the good news is that uh, we have found ways of making you talk, and uh, those ways have been invented uh, through adapting, uh, uh, through the ingenuity of the program developed by uh, Warwick uh, University and the Health Foundation. Uh, the Safer Clinical Systems approach has basically adapted techniques from high-risk industries so that you can uh, map your clinical systems, as Andy described, and diagnose the hazards. So this, this is a real uh, innovation. And what you discover when you use these systematic structured approaches is that everywhere in health systems is, uh, is, is highly risky. Here be dragons uh, is, is, the, is the, the consistent finding of attempts to map clinical systems. Many of these systems are highly improvisatory. They have never been designed purposefully. They've simply come into being, and they remain, for the most part, uncharted territory. What you find, not across just the projects that were in Safer Clinical Systems, but more broadly, is that how we do things around here is hugely variable, depending on where you are. So even within the same hospital, how you order an x-ray do you know where the drugs are in the eight different places they might be on the ward? How do I show I have signed off this lab result? How do I know this commode is clean? How do I label this blood specimen? How am I going to know how long this patient should go nil by mouth? How do I ensure that the night shift knows what the day shift knows? None of these are harmonized. None of these are star standardized. They happen in completely different ways, often even depending on who is on, uh, not even just where this is happening. So the result of this is that uh, when you're observing what's happening, which is what my group does, we, we hang around in uh, healthcare settings and observe what is happening. What's actually happening is that staff are spending huge amounts of time trying to figure out how we do things around here and how we do things today. And if you watch, for example, um, trainees, junior doctors, trainee nurses, they're not spending their time, uh, a lot of the time, acquiring clinical skills. They're actually trying to figure out how do I sign off this bloody x-ray? That's, that's what they're spending, that's what the learning overhead is, it, that's the learning overhead that's being generated in these systems. So when you're observing what's happening, staff are spending vast amounts of time basically trying to recover basic uh, processes, hunting around trying to find uh, the, the medicines, a clean commode, a clean stand, and figuring out uh, where things actually are. And th this is very bad for all kinds of reasons, but one of them is that we, we try to fix these problems by basically encouraging people to, to document. And uh, this, this is not a good strategy. One of the things it does is it makes people extremely frustrated. And there are all kinds of reasons. The psychology of this is very well known. But basically, when people are constantly frustrated by not being able to do what they need to do to get the tasks done, they become impatient, they become uh, stressed, and they begin to behave in ways that they would prefer not to behave. So uh, when, you're not, uh, when you're not able to work in a system that's supporting you, people, people invariably uh, become uh, impatient with their colleagues. And when you're not being nice to your colleagues, it's very hard to be nice to your patients too. So, so these are real problems and the, 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 the research behind why it's a very bad idea to make people work in stressful systems is really very well known. But the, the bet that the more direct problem is that we end up with an awful lot of things happening, accidents happen all the time because of these systems that we're asking people to work in. And these are at a very, very mundane level. I'm not talking about uh, big things a lot of the time. I'm talking about an accumulation of multiple little things. 
The good news is that we are getting much better at figuring out where things could go wrong. And I really think an awful lot of credit is, is due to the Warwick University team in terms of, of leading the way and in innovating with, um, with, with working out how we can do this. The bad news, as, as Andy has already uh, described, is that we're still not getting very good at fixing some of these problems. And this is, this is some of the, the ways in which I want to go beyond safer clinical systems to draw on my experience um, of the literature and uh, working in, in patient safety really over the last 10 years. So let me tell, me, tell you about some of these. Um, the first problem is the, the hammer and nail problem. And this is the problem that somebody who's got um, a quality improvement hammer uh, thinks that everything is a quality improvement project. And I am not denying uh, for a single moment that small improvement projects and PDSA cycles led by small teams have a very important role. That, that is absolutely not what I'm saying. But I am saying we, have, we are using that approach too much and not all problems are tractable to this approach. And as, as long as we keep pretending they are, we are not going to solve a lot of the problems that challenge uh, healthcare. Many of the issues that are underlying these unreliable processes are extremely big and hairy, and they are simply not solvable by a really enthusiastic, fantastic group like, uh, like the one Andy led in, in Bristol. Some of the reasons for this are the ones we keep hearing about, uh, old-fashioned attitudes, uh, sometimes from, from another century. Uh, but I don't think that's, that's, that's the, the sole problem, although we keep pretending that, that, that that's, that's the basic. Some of it is to do with uh, technologies from other centuries that uh, simply have not uh, caught up with the reality of, uh, of healthcare today. But some of it is all to do with something I call the, the magic water problem. So my father is from uh, a small town in the west of Ireland called Kilkee, which is uh, quite a popular tourist uh, destination, a sort of seaside town. It's very nice. And the first um, tourist guide uh, was published in 1836 uh, by Mrs. Mary John Knott. And in the book, she notes that there is a Chalybeat Spring outside the town. A Chalybeat Spring is, is a, a, a spring rich in uh, ferrous material, a sort of iron-bearing spring. And she says, well, wouldn't it be great if these healing waters could be made attractive and useful to the invalid visitors of Kilkee uh, by being put under the care of some deserving poor person? So that deserving poor person was my great-grandfather. And here he is outside his uh, Chalybeat Spring. And uh, this, 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 he called it a spa, which you can just about see in the, in the letters over the top. This was an extremely um, popular thing to do. People would, would come out to this spa and their report afterwards would be that they felt absolutely fantastic after, after uh, coming and having the water. And you can see this lady here in the absolute pink of health. So how do we explain this, this phenomenon? Well, one could be that this is simply a placebo effect and we can just uh, let it go. A second is that we focus in on, on the water and maybe there is some magical property in this water. And certainly if we analyse it, we do find it's, it's very rich in a number of, of minerals and so on. And in particular, it's rich in uh, ferrous oxide. Uh, so perhaps there is some health giving effect, but, but one dose probably isn't enough. So let's, let's really figure out what's going on here. Well, what's going on is that if you want to get to the, the spring, you have to start at the bottom of this cliff uh, on the edge of the sea, and you have to keep walking. And uh, you go higher and higher up along this cliff. And when uh, we were younger, my parents used to say, if we kept, uh, kept going, we might be able to see America from the top. And this never seemed to happen, but you would get to the top, and you would have absolutely splendid views, absolutely fantastic and then you would come down the other side and you would be at the spring. So what's actually going on here is that in order to feel great, you have to set yourself a goal, you have to have fresh air, you have to have exercise, you have to be with family and friends, you have to feel you have achieved something, which is get to the top of the, the mountain, almost literally, and down the other side, and you have hydration. So what's actually going on here is that the water is one but only one important ingredient in a whole system that is making the change and I think we make the problem of magic water all the time so we foreground things as if they are the thing that's making the change and we background things that are actually crucial to making the change happen and so we end up with problems like uh, thinking that all we have to do is introduce a checklist and all will be well and that's a magic water problem the second problem is the spaghetti bolognese problem. And uh, if I invite you to stay at my house for a week and uh, the butler happens to be off but leaves instructions on how to feed you, 
then uh, what I might do on the first night is feed you spaghetti bolognese and uh, you go to bed very happy and I think this is great. I have solved the problem of how to keep you fed and happy for the week. So the following morning for breakfast, I give you spaghetti bolognese, uh, I give you spaghetti bolognese for lunch, I give you spaghetti bolognese for dinner. And somehow by Friday, spaghetti bolognese turns out not to be the solution that I thought it was. So what is the intervention here? Well, something that's at too high a level is provide food, because that's not giving me the guidance. Uh, provide spaghetti bolognese is not the right answer either because it's too specific and what I need is something in the middle provide a nice fresh nutritious meal appropriate to the time of day then I could then I've got something to work with the next problem we come to is the thousand flowers problem and this I think has been one of the challenges that we, we really have to confront so what is happening with quality improvement projects I'm afraid is that we create a thousand flowers each one of them is extremely pretty but each one of them has to be looked after in a completely different way. They have to be grown in different soil, they have to be watered at different times. And what they're actually doing is reproducing the problem that we don't have systems that people don't have to learn every time they walk on to Ward 27, having just come from Ward 28. They, they're, they're, I think, encouraging de-standardisation, de, de when actually what we need to get to is that you know pretty much what you're going to do, how I sign off the X-ray uh, when I come here. The next problem is, is my lovely baby. And uh, this, this is a photograph that goes uh, slightly further back than the 1980s. Um, but basically, every parent thinks that their own baby is lovely. And no matter how funny looking they are, uh, they, they, they appear to be absolutely beautiful to their own parents. And we, we end up with a conspiracy of enthusiasm. And this is a problem that we've known in the evaluation field going back to the 1960s, <clears throat> not too long after the uh, photograph was taken. The specific reforms are, affected, are advocated as though they're certain to be successful. We must be able to advocate without the excess of commitment that blinds us to reality testing. And I don't think we are doing reality testing. We keep talking about quality improvement and various other things as if, uh, as if each flower is beautiful, each baby is beautiful, and not, not always being very honest about uh, the, the, the problems. The other issue is that the lovely babies don't scale. I, I have rarely, rarely seen a baby that, that has moved from one place to another, and it's too late to wait until the inspectors have been around and said, this isn't working, to then go off and find a baby that you can adopt. We, we have to find ways of, of sharing before that. But as Carl McQuay has pointed out, we're full of secrets you can't give away, even things that work are very hard to, 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 to give away. So what we are ending up with are fantastic solutions that, that remain hidden because there is no way of opening the trap door or even knowing that the trap door is there. So I was in New York recently and uh, it was a fantastic doctor gave me these four questions that they ask every single day for every single patient and they have to answer as a team because they have discovered that when they do, they, they get to a shared mental model of what they're doing. This is all designed on, on human factors principles. Um, why is the patient in hospital? And they realise that they don't always know why the patient, they don't agree as a team why the patient is in hospital, why is the patient still in hospital? What do we need to do to get the patient to, 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 to be safely capable of being discharged? And where will, can they be discharged to safely? If you start asking that question on the first day, you're already ahead of the game in terms of figuring out what's going to happen next. This, this doctor was extremely frustrated because she has no way of sharing this. When I tweeted it, it went crazy on Twitter, so there was clearly a huge appetite for it, but how do you curate it? How do you, make, how do you give these secrets away? We don't have the architecture or, uh, there in order to share these, these fantastic solutions that do become uh, available. Everyone knows the story of um, Wayne Jowett, the teenager who tragically died um, uh, following an inadvertent administration of Incristine. The lesser known story is that uh, the doctor involved had just moved from Leicester, where there was a local solution to the problem of having Christine in the operating theatre, to Nottingham, 30 miles up the road, where they didn't have the same solution. That secret had not been given away, and as a result, a, a terrible tragedy occurred. So we, we have got to get better with the problem of non-scaled uh, solutions. I think we're often mistaking institutional problems for organisational ones. By institutional, I mean a whole sector, something that we need to think about as an industry, not just organisation by organisation. A, a classic example of this is something like the sepsis six. These are six very sensible things you need to do. 
If you take just one of them, administer empiric intravenous antibiotics, this turns out to be an extremely difficult thing to organise to do within an hour. And this is because you have to fix at least 10 things before you can even get to administering the, the antibiotics. So it's not keep calm and do the sepsis 6, it's keep calm and do the sepsis 60. It's 10 things you have got to fix before you can even get to implementing the sepsis 60. And, and we, we haven't got yet to the point where we're recognising the work that has to happen before the work can even begin to happen. And again, we get uh, when people are asked to implement something like this and they can't work through the, the processes, you basically get bullying as a response to making things happen when they don't happen through a better way. This is not an NHS problem. I cannot emphasize this strongly enough. I've just spent the last four months in the States, and when you walk onto the sharp end of the wards and you talk to people, they're talking about exactly the same things. US studies are showing that nurses are interrupted every six minutes. Uh, they spend 10% of their time uh, working around operational failures, glitches, and so on, constant. And it's exactly the same as what's happening in the, in the UK. So, so we have to stop beating ourselves up. This is an industry problem. This is a sector problem. It's an institutional problem, not an organizational problem. When they tried to introduce stroke care in the US, they found only 20% of organizations were able to get themselves sorted to do the equivalent of the sepsis 6 for stroke patients. Problems we cannot solve by continuing to treat them as organisational problems include things like labelling of drugs and include things like um, standardising the kind of equipment that we're using across the, the NHS. Why do we have a, uh, a, a, a device on one arm that's pumping narcotics in and a device on the other arm that's uh, measuring blood pressure but they're not talking to each other? Cannot solve this as an organisation. This, this is an institutional problem. And industries that have made themselves safe have understood this. They have industry-wide things you need to be doing and then you do quality improvement. But we're, you, we're doing quality improvement first. Car industry is another, another excellent example. So what we end up doing is keep, we continue to bracket too many things as being too hard that we just can't solve because we keep asking small clinical teams to solve them. So what we're continuing to do is try to kill mosquitoes one at a time when we need to be draining the swamp. I'll finish now by talking about, I think, one of our biggest, biggest challenges, and this is the problem of many hands. So this is a classic in the public administration literature, and it, uh, it, it originates from analysis of the Centralia mine disaster in 1947, uh, when over 100 men were killed in, in a mine. And uh, so basically the idea behind the problem of many hands is that the miners at Centralia, seeking somebody who would heed their conviction that their lives were in danger, found themselves confronted not with any individual but with a host of individuals fused into a vast, unapproachable, insensate organism. And I'm afraid we have pretty much the same thing. We have too many hands involved and the profusion of agents obscures the location of agency. Who is responsible for, for sorting out things like drug labelling, equipment, all that sort of stuff we need to be doing. So I think we've ended up with, I love the tweet of God, if any of you are on Twitter, we've ended up with somebody should do something, but who is the somebody and what should it be? So what now? Stop thinking about safety as an organisational problem that we can sort out organisation by organisation. Start thinking about it as an institutional problem. Give people templates, crib sheets, whatever you want to call them, for well-designed operational systems. Be clear about what's the hard core. What should everybody be doing in a similar way? What's the soft periphery that they can customize? So stop thinking about this as problems we can scale and go to a mass customization model. We know it can be done because they did it with door to balloon in the States. You just tell people the five things that they need to be doing in a fairly similar way and, and they can do it. Uh, so that, that went from... That, went, uh, that, that was a huge success in terms of number of people you could get into the cath lab within 90 minutes. Similarly, we've seen the same kinds of things. The NHS led the way in, in putting um, equipment into kits for, for, for central line insertion. And we've seen that solutions that they've developed in anaesthesia that, that, that have, where, where people have come together have worked. So we need integrating, coordinating structures. The basic principles have got to be coordination and then customization. We need systems for curating interventions, measures, business plans, hits, hints and tips, and we need full open access to those. We have enough already, as I've learned to say, of magic water, spaghetti bolognese, thousands of flowers, lovely babies, and mosquitoes swatting, and we're still left with 
signs of chaotic, poorly coordinated systems. So I think we have got to move together hand in hand, and that's going to mean hands up as our next step. Thanks very much.